In week two of our labs, we're going to look at air compression. So we have three objectives that we're going to try to accomplish with this lab um, and this video. So one of them is we want to learn a little bit about some terms related to air compressors. So single versus multiple stage compression, um, as well as the idea of coolers. So intercoolers and aftercoolers and what they mean and what their function is. We want to talk about some of the contaminants that we might see in the system, and that might be dirt, it might be water, um, would be two common contaminants. And we'll look at ways that we can reduce those contaminations and also look at the problems that they cause. And then uh, we're going to do a little bit of work on electric motors. So we have some ideas about synchronization and what we're going to do is use that knowledge to try to understand what happens when we try to start an electric motor, as well as look at strategies for reducing some of the impacts that we'll see. Okay, so first of all, let's look at our air compression system. So it's not just an air compressor, all right? We have lots more going on than just a device that takes air and compresses it. So we have a bunch of different components and let's take a look at what those mean. So if we thought about what it would have what we would have if we had perfect compression. Okay, we take some air and we compress it and we add in a little bit of work to do that. And I guess if it was perfect, everything that would happen is we would reduce the volume of that air and our pressure would go up. And that's a good thing because we want to store all of that stored energy in the form of pressure. Um, however, that's not how it works. Um, in the case of real compression, and we compress and we put in work, not only does our pressure and volume change, but also our temperature goes up. The temperature going up is not useful to us. So we don't really want that. It's not desirable. It's actually a wasted energy in this case. And the other problem is that it's hazardous. So it could cause burns, it could cause a fire, it could cause damage to equipment. So we really don't want it. So we bring in an aftercooler, okay? And an aftercooler is something that's gonna cool after all the compression is done. And what it looks like is we go through our compression cycle, okay? We're left with hot air coming out and we pass it through a cooler which then reduces that air temperature down to something that is safe. Okay, so that would be the role of the aftercooler, our primary role. Um, and so often in these systems, we're gonna see an aftercooler. Ours in this case, in our simulation is water cooled. So we use water cooling through a heat exchanger, but sometimes they're air cooled um, or other types of cooling. Okay, so if we have an air compressor and we want to compress air to a moderate pressure, okay, sometimes we may do that with one device. But if we want to increase that pressure more and more, it becomes very challenging because we have to keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and that air has to occupy a very small space and that can be difficult to do. So what that brings us to is a problem. If we're going to com continue to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, first of all, it's very difficult for us to design an air compressor that's going to do that. Okay? It has to take a large volume of air and squeeze it down to a very, very small space. The other problem that we have is that the temperature is going to continue to increase and it may get to a point where it is too hot. Okay, so let's look at ways that we can create large air pressures, but get away from these two problems. So the first one would be that we break up our compression instead of having one compression stage that goes the entire way from full volume to minimum volume. 
and we break that up into two separate compressions. So we do a moderate compression on the first, it passes it to the next section, and then it does another compression on it. And we could have multiple, multiple stages. And we can develop high air or pressures by going through multiple stages. But we run into a problem. In this case, our temperature continues to increase. So in that second stage, and sta if we have multiple, multiple stages, third stage, fourth stage, um, we're going to continue to increase our temperature. So we've solved our issue with the physical size and dimensions of the air compressors, but we still have an issue with temperature. Well, if we think back to how we solved the outlet temperature issue using an aftercooler, um, what we might tend to do is use an intercooler. So we start out with our air coming in and it goes through a first stage of compression. And what comes out is moderate pressure, moderate temperature, and we cool it. So we reduce that temperature and then it goes into a second stage of compression and the pressure gets increased even more and when it leaves because the temperature has increased again we cool it at the end. So adding in the inner cooler gives us the advantage of having a cooler machine and that's going to have a longer lifespan and going to be more reliable for us. It's going to be safer for us but there's also an improvement in efficiency. And when we have air that is cooler, it's gonna be more dense. And that dense air is already starting at a lowish volume for its pressure, so it doesn't take us as much work to increase its final pressure. Um, so we do have some advantages thermodynamically with having intercoolers in place. So they're very common within multiple stage compression. Okay, so if we were to look at how that's laid out on our simulator screen, um, we are gonna start out with our air compressor. It's gonna go through um, a stage one compression. The air is gonna leave and go through an intercooler it's going to go through a second stage compression and then finally through an aftercooler at the end. And as I said, our air compression system is a water cooled system. So the inner cooler and the aftercooler are both cooled using fresh water. So now that we know the components in that system, when let's talk about the air that's coming in. And we have two problems when we see atmospheric air coming in, okay? It's not just air. It's not pure air. And when we talk about what's in it, maybe we could call it some contaminants. And two major contaminants that we'll talk about today would be dirt and humidity in the water, okay? So air that comes into that air compressor is not just air, has some humidity with it, and it has some dirt with it. And both of these things can be problems inside of air systems. So they can cause things like erosion, they can cause corrosion, uh, they can cause fouling of heat exchangers. Um, if they move through the system, they can cause uh, components to stick or not move freely. So they can cause a lot of problems and we would really like to avoid having them. So let's just look at some common ways in our system that we would remove particulates, so dirt. So first thing that we would have would be on the inlet to our air compressors, we're gonna have a filter. So some sort of barrier that's gonna prevent dirt from getting in to our air compressor. Okay, and we can see it by that box with the little X on it. Uh, would be a, a filter. Um, we also later on in this system have a filter dryer um, and so like the filter component uh, might look like uh, the filter shown has to be able to withstand high pressures um, so it's a, a little more robust looking filter uh, canister 
Um, and so you typically would have some sort of filter so that we protect all of the downstream components from passing dirt or other contaminants through. When we talk about humidity, humidity that's brought into our system uh, tends to condense on cool surfaces. And that happens especially after we've pressurized the air. It tends to condense uh, more readily. So we have risk of water accumulation at cool surfaces. And some of the cool surfaces might be in your receiver. So we have tanks that are reasonably cool. Um, or else we have places like our after cooler or our inner cooler. So we have cool surfaces that are exposed to high pressure, humid air, and we're going to tend to collect water. Now, these systems are all designed to be able to remove that water, and we have drains at the bottom. So we have a spot where water can accumulate, and over time, we need to remove that from the system. We don't want buildup of water because, one, uh, it could carry over through to the next section of your system. And generally, in our air system, we just want air moving through it. We don't want uh, a, a liquid. Um, and then the other thing, it can cause corrosion or issues with some of your equipment. So we want to drain it on a regular enough basis. Last thing that we want to look at in this module is starting a large motor. And the air compressors are good examples of that. They have a fairly large energy draw, and this can become challenging for us. Okay. They have a large motor to drive them. And if we think back to our ideas of synchronization, when we synchronized the generator to a grid, what we were doing was matching that generator's rotational speed to the grid. And the grid is composed of all kinds of generators, motors, and other electrical components. And they're all spinning in sync or at the same speed uh, or some multiple of the frequency. But they're all connected to each other. And we remember that we took lots of care to match the frequency of the generator when we were connecting it to the grid. How about when we connect a motor? Because motors and generals or motors and generators are fairly similar components. We'll think back to our AC waveform. When motors are first connected, uh, or when we're first gonna introduce them to the grid we're going to have our maximum frequency difference. So there's a substantial difference. If we think about our generators, we were trying to match within uh, you know, a fraction of a hertz. And in this case, we're off by a significant amount. So when we do want to get it connected, ultimately we want those things to be in sync. And it's going to take a little bit of work to do that. So for us to get that machine up and running, it needs to be accelerated. And that has to happen in a fairly short amount of time. And in order for that to accelerate that quickly, it's going to take a large amount of energy. And what we see is that we have a large current draw during that startup. OK, so with that concept in mind, we're going to explore that a little bit more in our lab this week. Here's the things that we're going to do. Uh, so you're going to have an exercise to run through and you'll make some observations. And some of the things that we're going to be looking at in this lab, um, we're going to identify some of the different components in the, in the system. We're going to do some logging of temperatures. So we'll look at what our normal operating temperatures would be through the different stages and intercooler and aftercooler. Um, we'll introduce some faults to the coolers and see what happens. Um, we'll look at where does water accumulate and how do we deal with water that has been accumulated in our systems. 
And then as a group, we're going to do an activity where we'll look at the electrical loading on the air compressor motors and look at different ways that that uh, system reacts to starting and stopping and some strategies we can use with large motors to mitigate the large current draw. Okay. So make sure you've watched this video and kind of get an idea of some of the components and some of the theory that we've talked about and then um, come to the lab and uh, you'll have to take a few notes as you go through the lab. So just make sure you have a pencil and uh, a pad of paper uh, just to be able to log some temperatures and other things. Okay, uh, great. I'll look forward to seeing you in your lab this week.